Hi, it's Earth Computer, and today I want to show you how we got the barrier block on the Prototech Survival Server. So, to my knowledge, this is the first time that anyone has done this on a um, on in completely vanilla survival. Uh, we did it two days ago, as of the time of recording, um, as of the time of you viewing it. If I'm actually good at recording, it might be maybe a, a one or two days after that. Um, so people who found it, that's um, obviously Curb, me and Cheetah um, and yeah um, Curb will be making another video in parallel to this uh, he will be going more over how we got it in survival including some footage from it um, and yeah, like a, a more uh, like a simpler and, and more practical focus explanation I will be going in this video more in depth including showing the code and um, and get, and giving people a, a deeper insight into how this stuff works. Uh, don't don't be scared by the code. I, I will I will go through it as, as if you haven't seen code before. Um, but yeah, I will be um, going through it in depth and try not to miss anything too much out. Um, so yeah, I'll see you there. This method to get the barrier block works in theory between 1.9 and 1.12. We've only tested in 1.12, of course. Does not work in 1.13 and above because you cannot um, influence um, population of igloos or any kind of population for that matter um, as uh, as the world is generating. Um, and it, of course, does not um, the usual does not work in bedrock condition and stuff like that. And, of course, um, this only gets the block and not the item. The item um, we may be able to get using a different method once we have the block. Um, but that would be that will be coming later, possibly on my channel, possibly um, somewhere else. I'll be sure to link to it when it does come out. The quest for the barrier block started actually when we were trying to find a way to get the structure blocks. Uh, well... Cheetah thought um, of a way that you could potentially get structure blocks in survival and that is by exploiting the fact that certain structures uh, that generate in the world have structure blocks inside them inside the actual MBT files if you load them um, it actually turns out for reasons I'm about to show you in a minute that you can't do this but you could get the barrier block so we're going to take first of all a quick look over the code which places a structure block in the world. So this is where we looked first for the um, for getting structure blocks in survival. Um, so you can see first of all that it loops over every block in the in the structure block, um, and then um, it the first thing it does unfortunately is it filters out these structure blocks. So. It will never even place a structure block in the world, so unfortunately for us, um, that meant we couldn't get structure blocks. Um, but then there's a curious bit of code here, right? So it will check if the new block is a tile entity. And then it will also check if there is a tile entity already at the position in the world the new tile entity will be placed. And if both of those things are true, it will place a barrier block. I've got a theory as to why this is, so I'm going to explain it in a minute, but uh, let, let's just take this code at face value to, to start with. If there is a barrier block in the world, uh, sorry, if there is a tile entity in the world at the, at the location that a new tile entity will be, um, will be placed, then the game will first set the block to barrier before eventually um, placing the the block, the, the block from the structure in the normal way. So, yeah, that's that's how the uh, the structure block placement code works. It's just an overview of it. So here's my theory as to why um, Moyang decided to place barriers there, and it is this. So this is the no the code that is used generally when um, when the game places a block in the chunk. Um, so it run, runs some code here. It will do nothing if uh, if the block state doesn't change at all. Um, and then if that's false, then it will it will actually start placing stuff, right? Um, so it, it do, does a couple of things here, and then it will actually place the block. And here's the important part: it will 
run break block, we'll come to that later, and it will remove the tile entity if the block type doesn't match. Not the block state, the block type. Um, so you can actually see that in game here. We have a sign that says hello on it. Um, and if we run the set block command um, here to rotate the sign, it actually kept its text, right? Because um, it's the same, it's still a wall sign, it's the same block type. And we can set it back again like that. Uh, if we were to place a barrier block there, um, like this first, and then we place the sign back, you can see that the text is gone. Okay, uh, you can't really demonstrate this with the with the set block command with like chests or anything because the set block command has a special handling for uh, for inventories, but uh, sign works nicely, and it and this does work in general for when the game um, sets block types. Um, so basically Moyang placed a barrier block in the code there as a hack fix to make sure that the tile entity data is not kept when a structure is placed. So that is my theory on that. So let's take a quick detour and explain update suppression for those of you who haven't seen it. So let's say you want to create a floating comparator here because why not? Um, you would first of all break this block underneath the comparator. Um, so when you break a block, obviously the block sends out block updates to all six of its neighbors. So let's think about what the game actually does when it sends out block updates. Uh, so when the game starts to handling the updates for the breaking of the block, it needs to send updates to each neighbor that he, the block is placed to next to. And it can't send all the updates at the same time, so it will it will choose a path in which it can handle the the update. In this case, the first neighbor that is going to update is um, this rail, and the way it's coded, now this rail is the one that is that has to handle the update, and it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to try to send updates to all these neighbors, and it's going to send the update to this rail here, but it needs to go back because it needs to know to still update the comparator here. So what the game does is it stores a list, like a path, of all the updates that it's handling, and it passes through the next update, and so on, so on, so on. So first, in this case, we're going to have all these rails updated, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one, and then go back before it can actually go back to the comparator. Yeah. So, um, just in addition to the to just the positions, that the 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 um, Java does actually store some extra data, um, more more than just the position. So it isn't just a tiny amount of memory we're talking about. It's may, may, maybe a couple of hundred kilobytes or so uh, that it has allocated for this. Maybe it's even megabytes, depending on the server. And at some point, it's going to run out of memory, and it's going to stop execution of the code there. And it's going to go back to, um, well, it's not going to go back to update the comparator. Uh, so we can demonstrate this uh, this now. You can see the uh, the game updated all of the rails on the top, uh, but only some of the rails on the bottom because it got to about here, and then it ran out of memory. Okay, and then it didn't um, remember to update the comparator afterwards. Why do I bring up update suppression? Well, you can actually do the same thing um, in this bit of code we looked at a minute ago. So if you are able to chain some block updates, like uh, with update suppression, from this line of code that places the barrier block, then you can actually halt the execution of the code at this line of code and make it so that the game does not run this line of code below and place the block that it wants to place. So actually the barrier block would be left in the world. So the problem with this is that this set block state call actually doesn't send out block updates. Uh, so this uh, this final number here, this number four um, in the flags, uh, means that actually the, uh, this, this set block state call doesn't 
give out block updates. However, what's less obvious is that this 4 doesn't actually present, uh, prevent observer updates. So if we actually look in the definition of get block set block state here, there's a couple of things. So then it finds the, the, the chunk from the world, then it will set the block in the chunk. We'll look into that in more detail in a minute. Um, and then you know, it presses alert updates, then it sends updates to clients. And then here's the important bit, right? Block updates. These are, go these are going to be skipped for this um, for for this um, for this call. No block updates. However, observer updates are not skipped, and so actually um, observers uh, will be processed immediately by this barrier block update. So let's look in the observer code. Okay, uh, so what happens here is that it will start a signal which schedules a an update, and so schedule update is um, is a code name for um, for a tile tick, and tile ticks will have a certain delay, right? A uh, delay of two, in fact, for observers. Uh, but we don't want delay. We, we don't like delay because delay means that it's not instant, which means that uh, update suppression won't work. Update suppression has to be instant. It has to, it has to you know, um, create this chain of updates so that it runs out of memory and we immediately stop execution of code here. Um, so it needs to be instant. And for that, we need instant scheduling or, or instant tile ticks. So that's what I'm going to explain next. Instant tile tick is another thing that you can do with update suppression. Uh, you can see it's pretty obvious what it does here. If I trigger this observer, the piston instantly gets updated. Uh, you can see no normally with instant scheduling off, um, it would take time for the signal to travel down the line. I think it's a bit clearer with the repeaters. See, they all turn on at once. And so this is what we want. Uh, we want the observers to chain uh, uh, an update into something that uh, something like rails more and more readily um, uh, but the way it works is um, so another thing that uses tile ticks is water updates you can see that this waterfall um, gets placed instantly and you can see why the game might want to place a waterfall instantly rather than waiting for it to flow during world generation and so what the game does is it turns um, it turns on instant tile ticks when it generates a waterfall in world generation. And the idea is that we want to update suppress the waterfall generation while it's generating the waterfall so that the, the code halts execution and it stops. Um, it, it doesn't have a chance to... Uh, to turn off instant scheduling again so you have instant scheduling on permanently uh, until you generate another waterfall. Um, Coolman has uh, probably a more in-depth video about this so I will link to that in the description but we are just going to go ahead and use it for now. This observer trick actually ended up not working for us because if we go into the igloo I said if we go into the igloo, um, the tile entity that we're actually going for is this furnace, right? This furnace is in every igloo happens to be on a trunk border, which is which is really convenient. Um, so we were just placing an observer uh, right right here, okay? Um, but this observer is going to be replaced again by by a snow block. Um, so that may or may not matter depending on whether the snow block is placed in the world before the furnace or after. If the, if the snow block is placed after the furnace, then the observer can be tri is still there and can be triggered fine. But if the snow block is placed before the furnace, then the observer will be replaced. And sadly it turns out that the snow block is actually placed before the furnace. So the observer trick didn't actually end up working out. 
Um, it is still possible to use the observer if you place um, if you place it, for example, here where the torch is. Um, but you need more flying machine or um, or or piston trickery to to put the observer there, and it's just more of a pain. And we found another way anyway. So we had set up this setup here. Um, so the idea is that when you have a uh, comparator clock with instant tile tick on, obviously the updates chain goes in a loop and it will eventually run out of memory and, uh, and halt execution of the comparator clock so it gets stuck in a state like this and next time you give the comparator an update it will continue the loop again until it runs out of memory again so it's, this, it's basically a much more compact way of doing uh, the rail setup if you have instant tartic on. Uh, so we had a setup like this um, but it was working inconsistently uh, and we uh, we didn't know why and it actually turned out that well we then found out that the thing I have just told you with the um, with the snow replacing the observer and then we were wondering why it ever worked at all um, we were wondering that for quite a while and then Cheetah Codes came up with the idea uh, that maybe it was actually uh, the shulker box, so we actually had a shulker box instead of the the, the furnace in there. And a shulker box. Shulker box. Instead of a furnace. And maybe it was the removal of the shulker box giving out a comparator update that uh, was actually updating the comparator and the observer was actually completely unnecessary. Um, so that still wouldn't explain why um, why the uh, why it was inconsistent and we actually still don't know why it was inconsistent but this uh, this new method we have with just the comparators uh, is working a lot more consistently. In fact this is not our final setup I'm going to show you that in a, in a bit um, but this here, cheetah codes theory actually ended up being uh, true and I'm going to show you it in the code right now. So let's take a look in the code for our um, for our comparator update. Uh, so we're starting here again where the barrier block is placed and we're going to take a look at what happens when the game sets a block in the world. Uh, you can see that we end up here uh, and uh, we have looked at this code before uh, it will find a chunk and it will set a block in the chunk. Now this time we're going to look actually inside where it sets the block in the chunk, see what it does, look a bit more carefully. Okay, it does some stuff and then some and then it does this check here, but then it will go down to here. And let me just scroll down a little bit further, we don't need to look at that. Um, and then we get down to this run break block and remove the tile entity if the block types don't match. Uh, I, before when we looked here uh, I glossed over this run break block but here we're going to actually look at this uh, because when the uh, the block does not match the previous block it runs uh, break block on the block that was um, th on the old block in that position. So that happens and so for shulker boxes what does break block do? Well it gets the tile entity at the position and and uh, checks if it's a shulker box of course um, then it does some things um, and then it will um, update the comparator output level at the position. So this is uh, starting to get into territory here where okay this has something to do with comparators with, with um, yeah, we're updating comparators from the shulker box because the shulker box got broken. Okay, and update comparator output level goes to here. Um, and it's looking for comparators. Um, it will only update comparators, not just any block. Um, and it will call the normal block update method, neighbor changed. And for comparators, uh, this is implemented like this. Now we're going to look at this method in more detail in a minute 
Um, but for now, if if the comparator can stay where where it's uh, where it's been placed, as in it's it's not in a state where it has to pop off, um, then it will call update state. Okay, and then update state will uh, will schedule a a tile tick. And so if we have instant tile ticks on, we we can start a block update chain just like before. This is our final setup for what we uh, had on PT. Um, it's basically the exact same thing as what I had just shown you. It's just I've got an extra comparator here. Um, just to read from the um, to read from the shocker box and then one to to update suppress. Um, it's basically the exact same concept as what I had just shown you before. But uh, it does turn out that uh, it's possible to do this method without instant tile tick. Um, and I'm about to show you how. So I said I would come back to this method um, and that's because there's actually two possible code paths that you can go through here. Uh, one of them is uh, if the comparator can stay where it is and so not pop off then it will update its state so do the the, um, the tile tick and then you, you you create an update chain from there. Um, but if this is not true, if the comparator cannot stay where it is, so maybe it's, uh, it hasn't got a supporting block, maybe it needs to pop off, then actually it will instantly, um, well, drop the block as the item and then set the block to air. Well, if um, the, the setting block to air uh, right, that sends out block updates, so you can chain updates from the setting block to air and also there's no delay here and we're not using the observer anymore so there's no delay there anyway, um, there either so actually we can make a, a setup completely without instant tile tick using this So now we're going to simulate the placement of the igloo and the replacement of the this tile entity with the extractor block here that is going to place a furnace where the um, uh, chest is and if you look inside the chest you're going to see that there's an item that is powering this comparator that is powering this uh, uh, rail and the function is so that we can propagate an update from that comp from that rail on top to the bottom rails below and cause the update suppression to um, trigger, but we do not want to wait uh, two ticks for this comparator to trigger. We want to do it as soon as the tile entity gets broken. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to su suppress the breaking of the block below. So now when the tile entity breaks, it will send a, an update to the comparator. The comparator is going to realize that is no longer uh, place on top of the block and it will immediately pop out and unpower this uh, rail there so right now if we simulate by loading the structure block we can see that the comparator pop up and now we have a ghost block there uh, but here instead of having a, a furnace we have a chance and the reason is because it's actually also a um, ghost block. So if we update, we can see this area there. Yeah. And if you're wondering why it doesn't work, like we were for 20 minutes, uh, then it's probably because you have carpet fill updates uh, to, to false. Um, if you, you need to turn that rule off, you need to set it to vanilla um, for this to work. So that's about all I wanted to say on the barrier block. Um, uh, yeah, again, um, go watch Curb's video if you haven't already. Um, it's more exciting. Mm. I mean, what? Um, what? And <laughs> <laughs> I tell you that now after I've trapped you in this video. Um, but yeah. yeah um, also, if you want to learn more about Incentaltic, go and watch uh, Coolman's video that I'll link in the description. And the same for. Um, for update suppression, update suppression 
uh, XCOM's videos also will, will be linked in the description. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'll see you in the next video whenever I uh, can be bothered to make that. Yeah. Bye-bye.